Well, good morning and welcome to worship. Thank you so much for joining us for this time of worship, whether you're able to be here in person or worshiping with us online or possibly even by radio in our parking lot. Uh, we are glad that we can gather together to worship Almighty God. Uh, today is All Saints Sunday, and it's a day in the life of the church where we remember those who have been faithful to the Lord and have gone before us into his eternal presence. And so we'll remember those later on in the service when we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. But as we begin this time of worship, let's quiet our hearts before God in prayer. Almighty God, we do gather together to sing your praises, to cry out to you. And so as we worship together, we humbly ask that your Holy Spirit will be poured upon us, that no matter where we may be in this world, that you will meet us here and draw us into your presence. We dedicate this time to you, and we pray all this in the name of the Lord and the Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, for those who are worshiping in person, you're invited to stand as you're able and let's sing our praises to God. Amen. You may be seated. And welcome once again to St. Paul. Thank you so much for joining us for this time of worship. Uh, my name is Clifton Vaughn. I'm the pastor of the congregation. And it's always a joy when we can gather together to worship the Lord. And so thank you for joining us in this time of worship. Uh, we know that each Sunday we have guests in our midst. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time, we have a, a gift for you. Uh, for those of you who are in person, you are invited to stop by the Welcome Center in our foyer in our Narthex, and it's a coffee mug, and you're welcome to take that as a gift from us to you, to as that gentle invitation, that gentle encouragement for you to get fully involved in the life of the church, and also to keep this church in your prayers. Uh, for those who are worshiping with us online, especially our first-time worshipers, you're invited to click on the online attendance link. That provides you space to share with us who you are and how we can reach out and encourage you on your journey of faith. It also provides you some space to share with us any prayer concerns or questions that you may have so that we can reach out and pray with you and encourage you. 
Uh, We are a church that wants to honor and to glorify God. We are a church that takes seriously that command from God to make disciples of Jesus Christ, believing that as we do, that our relationship with God transforms our lives and that it begins to transform our community and also this world. And so you're invited to be a part of that. Today, as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, It provides us that time to receive in a very tangible way that assurance that God is with us. Uh, We celebrate what's called open communion, meaning that anyone is welcome to receive these gifts. You don't have to be a member of this church or really a member of any church. All that we ask is that if you're sorry for your sins and you put your faith in Jesus, then you'll be invited to come. And so we'll celebrate that later on in the service. But hear now the gracious invitation from the Lord that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who seek to live in peace with God and with one another. And so therefore, let us quiet our hearts before God, turning away from our sins and confessing our sins to our most gracious Savior. So let's quiet our hearts for a time of prayer of confession, and then we'll pray together the prayer of confession that will be on the screen. And so let's quiet our hearts before God. So let us pray together. God of all the saints, God of all the sinners, hear our prayer. We want to be saint-like, holy, good, patient, loving, but often we end up feeling more like sinners, full of failures, of morality, selfish, mean. Perhaps you see us simply as human, as beloved and flawed, as trying and failing and succeeding. In all of this, forgive the wrong that we have done and the bless the good we have accomplished. Keep on loving us and helping us and molding us more and more into the image of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, hear the good news that God sent his only son into the world for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Well, you're invited now for those who are in person to stand as you're able and to pass the peace of Christ. If you're worshiping with us online, you're invited to write that in the comment section. And so may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let's stand and pass the peace. Peace be with you. Yeah, you're welcome to move that. I was about to say, <laughs> you will be very high. Yeah. I think that'll be fine. <laughs> That's close enough. Peace be with you. Peace. Okay, all right, we're gonna continue in our worship of God. And so for those of you in person, you're invited to remain standing and let's join together in singing a song of praise to Almighty God.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward for our time together. So just meet me down here by the altar table, children. So come on down. All right, kids, you can go ahead and be seated. That's great. All right, any other children want to come, big or old? I mean, I should say older or younger, not bigger. But um, hey, children, uh, there is a children's church that Mrs. Amy and our children's ministry leads for you. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and pray a prayer of blessing upon you and your time together at Children's Church. And so congregation, let's pray together, not only for these children, but any children that may be worshiping with us online as well. And so let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for these, your children. We believe that they are made in your image and that you love them so dearly. And so we pray for your blessing upon them and upon their time in Children's Church. Use that to draw them closer to you. Uh, we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you may go off to Children's Church or back to your seats with whomever brought you. All right, as they go off to their seats, uh, we're going to continue in our worship uh, by our covenant campaign. And so I invite Mr. Glenn to make his way over there. As he does, we're in the midst of our covenant campaign season. And next Sunday will be our Covenant Sunday. And for those of you who are a usual part of our church, you should have received a covenant card in the mail. If you did not, or you would like to participate and you didn't receive one, then you may pick up a covenant card packet in our Narthex area on the glass top table. In that, you have a covenant card that asks you to prayerfully evaluate your covenant with the Lord for the year of 2022. It does so by the different areas of membership. This is something that's purely between you and God and his church. And so when you turn it in next Sunday, hopefully you'll have it completed and signed and go ahead and seal the envelope. We'll receive them on behalf of God and hold on to them. And then we'll mail them back to you later in the year, still unopened, so that you'll be able to open up that covenant, to see how faithful you've been in that relationship with God. In so doing, it talks about the five areas. It talks about how faithful you'll be in your worship of God. So practically, what does that mean? How many Sundays will you be in worship, whether online or here in person? It also talks about how will you support the church financially, supporting what God is doing as we reach out to this community and beyond. It also talks about where you'll serve the Lord in ministry. So what ministry will you be a part of, whether it's through this church or one of the area ministries? But then it also talks about how often you'll be praying for the church. Is that only on Sundays or will you be praying a set number of days? Or, and then it also talks about how you'll be sharing your faith. So how often will you share your faith with those around you in your home, or in your workplace, in your community? And so I do encourage you to look through those cards and to prayerfully complete them and bring them with you to worship next Sunday. As we prepare, we've been wanting to highlight some ministries that we are increasing the budget for or starting to support in the year 2022. And so Glenn has graciously agreed to share about one of those ministries that we are saying that yes, this has our stamp of approval and support, and we encourage you to get involved in this ministry. And so Glenn, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Good morning, St. Paul. Good morning. We are relatively a newbie to the budget, but we are not a newbie to St. Paul. As most of you know, about four years ago, Jimmy Riddle and myself joined an organization called Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. It is a prison ministry. And you all individually and as Sunday school classes have helped us financially, uh, also through prayer, uh, cookies. You've donated a lot of cookies. I'll talk a little bit more about the cookies in a, in a moment. So we're not new to you, we're just new to the budget. And today I wanna to give you just a few highlights uh, about the prison ministry. I could actually talk all day about it as uh, we certainly enjoy it and it's been a real blessing to, to my life. Uh, Kairos 
really means God's special time. It was founded in 1976. Our headquarters are in DeBerry, Florida. We are in 40 states, 10 foreign countries. Believe it or not, we're only in about half the prisons that would like to have a Kairos team. We just do not have enough volunteers. Now, we only have 10 paid people involved in Kairos, and that's in our headquarters in Florida. So it is 99.9% .9 volunteerism. Now, to give you a little bit inside of what Jimmy and I actually do, we work, uh, our team works in Grimes Prison in Newport. Uh, there's also uh, ladies teams that work in prisons. Matter of fact, Mary Kay was involved in McPherson, which is just across the road from our, our prison of Grimes where we work. What we actually do to, for the prison ministry is we go in twice a month for about three or four hours and we have what we call prayer and share. And that's basically what it is. We get in small groups and we pray and we share. We share our problems, we share our praises. Uh, some of the uh, inmates, needless to say, have some really sad stories, no question about it. Uh, you know, most of us were born into Christian homes. We've known about God all of our life. That's not necessarily true for a big majority of the inmates. So you get very, very close to these inmates during that period of time. Then twice a year, we go in for four days, Thursday through Sunday. And no, we do not sleep in the prison. We go out at night. We spend about eight, about eight to 10 hours a day with the inmates uh, during that four day period. We have a series of talks uh, we sing. When the saints go marching in, it's one we use quite frequently in there. Uh, we listen to testimonies from them. At that particular time, we have several, several inmates that give their life to Christ. It's just very, 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 very rewarding. And it will shock you as to how well read in the Bible that some of those guys are. They have quite a bit of time, free time to, to read, so it's, it's very impressive. Unfortunately, some of those guys will never be able to come outside and share that with you. But I tell them all the time, you know, God wants you in here. So there are really, really some fine speakers, preachers that will never be out in what they call the free world. That's the expensive part of this program. During those four days, we cater in some really, really good food. There's 25 on the team, and we have 25 inmates when we go through these four-day sessions. And we cater in all the food. We have to buy a lot of supplies and whatever. That, that four days cost us approximately eight to $10,000. Uh, now, understand there's 25 of us on the team from several different churches, so it's not something that one church has got to support because we, most all of the churches do support us. So anyway, the, that's primarily where this budget money would go is to that, uh, to that four day session. Now, I just want to thank the mission uh, committee for putting us in the budget, the finance committee approving it, and the uh, admin council approving it. As I told you earlier, we always looking for volunteers. Uh, so if anybody's interested, uh, contact me. Uh, we, we go through an extensive training program, so it's not like you'll be going in there and not know what to do. So I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you. Like I said, we have women's teams and we have men's teams. Now back to the, the cookies. As you all, a lot of you brought us cookies. We take 1,600 dozen cookies in on each of those four-day sessions. 
Why 1,600? Because there's about 1,100 inmates over there and approximately 500 uh, free world employees that work in there. So everybody gets a dozen cookies. I don't know if you've had time to calculate or not, but that's 19,200 cookies. <laughs> and trust me, we always have excess cookies. Thank you all for your prayers, for your financial help. Like I said, any questions? As my wife said, if you don't want to know about the Cairo's prison ministry, don't ask him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn. And as he mentioned, if you have a desire, you feel God leading to get involved in that ministry, please uh, find Glenn following the service. He's usually hanging out in our Narthex area, and so he'd be happy to share with you more details about that and how you can follow God's leading to get involved. Uh, let's continue in our worship of God through our giving. Uh, we believe that God has given us everything in our lives, and so we give back to him a portion of what he gives to us. Uh, for those worshiping online or in person, you're welcome to text your donation or click on the online giving link. But as we continue in our worship, let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for all that you are doing, not only here at St. Paul, but through so many different ministries. And today we thank you for Kairos and for its ministry, and we pray for your blessing to rest upon it so that you will use this ministry to draw people, both those in prison and outside, closer to you. Now, as we offer you our gifts, we pray for your blessing upon them. Use them for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, no. 
may be seated. This morning's scripture is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Listen to these words, a conversation between Naomi and Ruth, her daughter-in-law. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, John, for helping to lead worship today. I, for those of you who are worshiping in person, hopefully you received a bulletin as you entered into the worship area. It provides you with different information about how to get involved in the life of the church and so if you have not had an opportunity to pick one up, please do so before you leave today and look through it to see how you can get more involved in the church. There are two inserts in the bulletin. Uh, one are the sermon notes for today. You're welcome to use that however you wish. There's some discussion questions on the back. An image of it has been posted on our Facebook page. But then the second insert is about our Thanksgiving food drive for our local food bank called Good Samaritan Center. And so we are trying to collect uh, 50 bags worth uh, to take to the Good Sam Center. This is a ministry sponsored by the United Methodist Men, but we need all of your help. And so uh, please do so. And when you bring food, just drop it off at the table over here. Or if you come during the week, just bring it by the church office. All right, so where we are, we have been studying as a church a book called The Story, and it's basically a retelling of the Bible using the New International Version of the Scriptures, telling the Bible in chronological order, so beginning at the beginning and going all the way to the end. Where we are in the biblical story is that we've just finished the book of Judges. That was that time where the chosen people of God, the Israelites, are already in the promised land, and it looked like things were going well, but then they forgot about the Lord, and so then they were conquered, and then they weren't doing well, and then they would cry out to God, and God would redeem them and bring them back, and then they would do well, and then they would forget. Well, so right in between Judges and when the calling of the first king and the prophets, which we'll begin looking at next week, right in between that is a story about Ruth. So it's a very small book in your Bible. It's a very small chapter in the story. But today, I want us to focus on the story of Ruth because what we see in it is this beautiful story of God's sovereignty, of God's plan and purposes that are working out in a family's life. Now, throughout this story, what we have been doing, we've been focusing on what's called the lower story and the upper story. The lower story is really that day-to-day -day interaction. How is our faith impacted as we go through this life day in and day out? That's that lower story. And then we have that upper story of what God is doing in the upper realms to bring about that salvation that is found in Jesus Christ, that redemption for humanity as we place our trust in his Savior Jesus, in his Son Jesus. And so that's the upper story. What I want us to do is for me just to retell the story of Ruth. And I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, and I want to draw just a few things from that lower story. And then we'll finish by looking at what God was doing in that upper story. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to the book of Ruth. Uh, there are some Bibles in the seats in front of you, or you may have a Bible on your smart device. Or if you brought your story book with you, feel free to turn to chapter 9, and you can follow along in that as well. 
All right, so where are we in the story? Well, it begins with Ruth chapter 1, and let me just read a few of these verses to you. So I'm going to read verses chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the days when the judges ruled, remember we're still in the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, does anybody remember Bethlehem? Yeah, you remember Bethlehem? Uh, for my little girls, when I, when I say Bethlehem, what do you think is their first thought? Well, you say, I would say Jesus too. But almost always when I say, what's their first thought with Bethlehem? They think about a star. I, I don't know. All right. So Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, Moab was outside that promised land. These were people who had not treated the Israelites nicely. These were people who were seen as foreigners, as seen as enemies to God's people. But there was a famine in the land, so they traveled to Moab. Uh, verse 2. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Noemi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. Uh, again, let me just stop. This was against the Lord's commands. This was against what God had revealed as his truth, as his blessing for life. And yet they stayed in Moab, and they married Moabite women. One named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And so what we see just from the very beginning of the story of Ruth is really a time of bitterness for Naomi. It's that season in her life that was very bitter. Life was very difficult. Life was difficult where she grew up and where she was raised in that place of Bethlehem. And so she moved with her husband, with her children, with her family into enemy territory. And life continued to be very hard so that she lost her husband and she lost her children and she became bitter. Uh, we see this in verse 19. Let me read it to you again. It's verse 19, 20, and 21. So by this point, they are heading back towards Bethlehem. And it says, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Uh, Mara is another word that means bitter. <laughs> because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And so what we see from the very beginning in this chapter one is the story of a woman whose life was full and has now become bitter and empty. And from the scriptures, she blames Almighty God. She sees that God's hand is upon her life and it's painful and it's bitter. Now we're gonna carry on in the story, but let me just say, for sometimes, and maybe for where you are in life, life can be hard. Life can be very bitter. And yes, Naomi blames a lot on God. God welcomes you to come into his presence, whether you're angry at him or joyful, whether you are full of bitterness full of grief, full of anger, whatever it may be, God is glad that you're here, and he invites you to come into his presence. All right, so Naomi, she makes it back home, and she's very bitter, but she doesn't make it back home alone, and what we see then is this faithfulness 
of a stranger or the faithfulness of a foreign woman. Let me back up to chapter 1 and let me read verses 16 to 18 to you. Uh, At this point, the two daughters-in-law are trying to travel with Naomi and she sends them back but one of them does not want to leave her, and that's the person of Ruth. And so let me read verse 16 of chapter 1. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. It's this utter love of a stranger. It's this utter love of a foreign woman who wants to help her mother-in-law, who loves her and wants to take care of her, doesn't want to see her abandoned, doesn't want to see her in pain, and is willing to go with her, uh, to leave the land that she knows, to leave any family members that Ruth had, to leave all of that behind and to go with Naomi and travel that journey all the way to Bethlehem with that unknown future, with that unknown of what's going to end up happening in life, but out of her love and her care for her, wanted to go. Now what we see as we move into the story in chapter 2 is that it's really a reflection of Ruth's heart. It's a reflection of Ruth's character. Uh, What we see in Ruth is this person who not only loved Naomi, but was willing to do whatever it took to take care of her. Uh, She was a hard worker. She was a person that would do right no matter the cost. Uh, We can see this several times in chapter 2. Let me just draw your attention to a few verses Uh, Chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And Ruth the Maobite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Uh, This was a reflection of Ruth's heart. They were without any food. They did not have any income. And yet the Old Testament law had provided that they could go behind those who were harvesting the crops and they could glean whatever was left over. And so as those who were utterly poor, they went out. She wanted to go into the fields and glean whatever was left to feed herself, but also to feed and to take care of Naomi. She wanted to do what was right. We also see this in verse 5. She goes into a field, and the owner of the field is a man named Boaz. Verse 5, Boaz asked the overseer of his harvest, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Maobite who came back from Moab with Naomi. And so we begin to see that others are noticing how she is working, how she's doing what is right. And then we can look at verse 10 through 12. It says, she bowed down with her face to the ground towards Boaz, and she asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now we have this utter blessing of Ruth. Now, remember, Ruth is a Maobite. She she is somebody from a a far-off place, a a foreign land. Uh, She grew up in an enemy territory, and yet now she's back in Bethlehem with Naomi, and she's doing all that she can to do what's right, to work hard, to take care of Naomi. And we have this blessing by Boaz. Well, then what we begin to see is a glimmer of hope. It's a glimmer of hope for Ruth and Naomi that it won't always go on as it is. And that moves us into chapter 3. And what we begin to see is that this 
person who owned the field, Boaz, was actually a relative of Naomi's husband. And because of that, he could become what was called a kinsman redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. It was somebody who could purchase that land and also could end up marrying Ruth and any children that they had would then be credited to Naomi and her husband. It was a particular in the law that would enable them for that family line to never die out so that that name would continue and that land would belong to that family. And so we begin to get a glimpse, well, that maybe this is what God has in store. And so in chapter 3, what we see is that Naomi suggests, well, why don't you, Ruth, go and share with Boaz that you would like for him to be your husband to redeem this land and to redeem our lives. And so we see a few verses. Let me just read a couple of those to you. It's in verses uh, chap chapter 3, verses 9, 10, and 11, where Boaz says, Who are you? I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people in my town will know that you are a woman of noble character. So we begin to see this glimmer of hope that, yes, God has not abandoned them. God has not deserted Naomi. God has not deserted Ruth. God has not left them alone in their bitterness and in their pain, but that God is always working out his will He's doing what is right and best for this family. And so we, the story goes on, and, and the next morning, Boaz sends Ruth home with a lot of food for Naomi, and then he works the next day to set about those legal proceedings so that he can purchase that land. He can redeem that land for Naomi's husband, and in turn, he can marry Ruth. And that's where we really begin to see God at work. Let me read verses 9 onwards. It says, Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth, the Maobite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephraim and be famous in Bethlehem. And then the story goes on in verse 13. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer, because he has become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. And then what we see is this wonderful image of this lady named Naomi who came back home proclaiming herself as bitter, as afflicted by the Lord, is now joyous and accepts that name of Naomi, which means beautiful, is now joyous and rejoicing and holding this new life, it says in verse 16. They na then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. 
and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. All right, so that's all in that lower story, this, this story of pain and bitterness, and then that glimmer of hope and the, the joy that comes from Almighty God. What, what do we see in the upper story? That, that's, what, that's that lower story, but what do we see in the upper story? Well, I think first off, we have to see that, that God has not deserted us. That God never deserted Naomi. He never left Naomi. No, no matter how much pain she was in, no matter how bitter life became, God never deserted her. And God was with her, leading and guiding and providing and blessing. But I think what we also see is this wonderful reality that Almighty God was not just the God for the Israelites, but that Almighty God was God for all of the world. That remember when Abraham was called, he was called to be a blessing for all the nations. And so here now we have that reminder that Almighty God was truly drawing all of the world to him. Uh, we see this especially as we look at the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can look at that both in Matthew and in Luke, but let me draw your attention to the one in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, what we see in the Gospel of Matthew is this wonderful lineage that goes all the way to Joseph and Mary and the child Jesus, but let me draw your attention to verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, where it says, out of the lineage comes Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Let me just stop. You remember Rahab? She was the one who enabled them to conquer Jericho. So we have Rahab, who again was a foreign woman, was included in that lineage, lineage of Jesus. Then Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And it goes down through King David and eventually to the Lord Jesus. It's that inclusion for all nations and all people that no matter the background, no matter the nationality, no matter the language, that they are welcome and invited to come and to put their faith and trust in Jesus. I love how Titus phrases it. It's in Titus 2, uh, verse 11. It's in your notes. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Uh, let me just stop. Doesn't that sound like Ruth? This is this woman who chose to go after her mother-in-law, to go and to serve her and to help her and to bless her. And Ruth was known as a person of noble character who did what was right and that's what we are called to do, to live our lives in a way that honors and that glorifies him. All right, so back to Titus 2.13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That's what we are called to do, is to put our trust and our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ who redeems our lives, who saves us from our wickedness and gives us that power and the ability to live a life that's pleasing to him. All right, so will you find your story in God's story? Will you find your story in the story of Ruth. How is God calling you to respond faithfully? How is God calling you to do what is right today? As we continue in our worship, uh, we're gonna continue through the sacrament of communion. On this All Saints Day, it's a day where we remember not only what Jesus has done for us, but we remember those who have gone before us into his eternal presence. 
that through their faith and their trust in him, their sins have been forgiven and they have been granted eternal life. And so please join with me as we bless these holy elements through the prayer of thanksgiving. And so the words are on the screen as well. And so please join with me. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we now name before you. And so in the quietness of this moment, you're invited to name those saints that have helped you on your journey of faith. And then we'll read the names of those who have passed away as part of our congregation in this last year. And so here are these names. Marie Davis. Marilyn Eaton. Georgia Roberts. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, 
Almighty God, now and forever. And let us pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite those who are assisting to please come forward at this time. Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. As they are preparing the stations, uh, let me just say this is the Lord's table, and so you're invited to come as the ushers direct. They will direct you to come down the center aisle, and you can come to one of the two stations. You'll be given a piece of bread, and then you're offered a small cup of juice. You're welcome to go ahead and eat them, and then spend any time at the altar rail that you would like in prayer. And then you may place the empty glasses in the bowls that are provided, and then go back to your seats by the outer aisle. We also have at the center stations uh, some gluten-free wafers for those who require them or also prepackaged communion elements so you'd, if you so desire, please just let one of the servers know. If you would like to receive the sacrament where you are seated, please just let an usher know and we'll be happy to bring the sacrament to you. Uh, but this is the Lord's table and you're invited to come as the ushers direct.
you're invited to stand as you're able and let's sing uh, together. Sing or Apostles Creed? Sing. Sing together. Thank you very much. Ask the question, what do you believe? As Christians, we utter these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, thank you again for worshiping with us, both either here in person or online or in the parking lot. We're glad that you are with us today. And please know you're welcome to always come back and be with us and to get involved in the life of the church and in serving the Lord. I would remind you about our Thanksgiving food drive, and uh, this is to help those throughout our community through our Good Sam ministry. And so please take note of that. But receive now this benediction and this blessing that as we leave this place today, may God truly bless you. May God's spirit live within your life to give you the power and the ability to do what's right. Go in peace in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.